Welcome to the Sweetwaters Church podcast. We're a church that loves and serves God passionately and loves people unconditionally. We pray that as you listen to the sermon, your faith will be stirred and you will discover Jesus in a deeper way. For more information about Sweetwaters Church, please visit our website at www.sweetwaterschurch.co.za. Now, let's listen to the latest sermon from our lead pastor, Pastor Kali. This is our Thanksgiving service, and we're going to give God all our thanks, all our worship, all our praise, and we're going to continue doing that throughout this time. And, but if you have your Bibles here, I want you to turn with me to the first book in the Bible, the book of Genesis, and I want you to turn to chapter 30, and we'll be reading from verse 37. Um, this particular passage, I heard this a few weeks ago, I went to a conference and this one gentleman, this one pastor shared that he's all the way from the Netherlands. If I were able to actually bring him here, I would have brought him here to actually share this particular message from this verse that he unpacked. But I thought it was so powerful that I thought I wanted to use this passage and almost bring a little bit of my flavor into this as we do Thanksgiving Okay, so I'm reading from the ESV version. It says, Then Jacob took fresh sticks of poplar and almond and plain trees and peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white of the sticks. He set the sticks that he had peeled in front of the flocks in the throws and that in the watering places where the flocks came to drink. And since they bred when they came to drink, the flocks bred in front of the sticks, and so the flocks brought forth striped, speckled, and spotted. And Jacob separated the lambs and set the faces of the flocks towards the striped and all the black in the flock of Laban. He put his own droves apart and did not put them with Laban's flock. Whenever the stronger of the flock were breeding, Jacob would lay the sticks in the froze before the eyes of the flock, and they would breed among the sticks. But for the feebler of the flock, he would not lay them there. So the feebler would be Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Thus the man increased greatly and had large flocks, female servants, male servants, camels, and donkeys. Let us pray as we prepare for God's word. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, and can we come before you and we thank you, Lord, that you will unpack, Lord God. The nuggets, the treasures, and your spirit will be with each, each and every one of us. And we thank you for all you do and continue to do as we celebrate Thanksgiving. We give you thanks for all you do and continue to do. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. <coughs> so just to give you some context to the passage I was just reading in our introductory part. Laban, Jacob's father-in-law, had Jacob working for him. But... Laban started seeing something about Jacob. Jacob had the favor of God upon him. So whatever Jacob did, the favor of God was with Jacob. So when Jacob met Laban to marry his daughters, there was an incredible journey that took place where Laban wasn't that wealthy yet. But when Jacob came into the family with the favor of God, they started to see blessing coming forth in that family, in that household. To such an extent that when Jacob married the two daughters, and we, we, can, we can unpack that later about the whole thing about the two daughters. But when he married the two daughters and he started growing in family wise, he decided that it's now time for him to pack up and move because he wanted to start his own journey. But Laban... But father-in-laws, sometimes they can get quite sticky. Eh? Don't look at your father-in-law right now if he's in the house. But they can get quite sticky because Laban knew the favor was on Jacob. And so he decided that if, if, if Jacob is going to leave, it means that the favor of God is also going to leave. So I'm going to actually miss out. The business that was coming through, the animals, the flocks, and everything, the riches came through this family line, through Jacob. So if he leaves, I might, like, I might actually become poor. And so Laban said, no, I need to make a plan here. Because I can't let Jacob leave. So he's like begging Jacob to stay. He's like, Jacob, I will pay all your wages. I'll pay everything that you need. Just stay here. But Jacob like, no, but I want to start my own thing. I want to get out of your shadow. I want to do something for myself and for my family. My family is increasing, so I need to provide for them. 
And so Jacob come with this ridiculous idea, this ridiculous concept to say, out of the flock, I will just take the ones that are spotted and striped. You take the ones that are like almost like the thoroughbreds. So the thoroughbreds of the goats and the thoroughbreds of the lambs you can keep. I will just take the spotted and the striped ones. But hey, father-in-laws. Because hmm? he saw this deal and he's like, no, but I don't like this also. So I'll just try and make it even harder for Jacob to leave. So he took all the spotted and striped lambs and goats and he sent his sons on a three-day journey away from Jacob. He even took the female lambs. It means like they cannot even breathe. They cannot do anything. And so Jacob sees this. And he's like, well, I get this, but I, I serve a God that is bigger than this. And so then we get into this passage to get to verse 37 and 38. It says, Then Jacob took fresh sticks of poplar and almonds and plane trees and peeled them, white streaks in them, exposing the white of the sticks. He said the sticks that he had peeled in front of the flocks and the froes, that is the watering places where the flocks came to drink. So let me unpack this for us quickly. Have you ever watched a horror movie? Here's the thing about horror movies, okay? If you watch a horror movie and you're alone at home, yeah, you know what's happening. Then it comes late at night. And then you start hearing sounds that weren't there before. And you're like, all you can think about is that horror movie that you just saw. And you're like, they're getting for me. They're coming. Or let's just see, you're okay, you don't, you don't worry about this, but you fall asleep. How many of you, after watching a horror movie, had nightmares? About that monster that wants to come and, you know, cut you out. And it brings me to the title of this morning's message. What you see is what you get. What you see is what you get. See, if you're going to watch horror movies... Best belief that if you're going to see it, you might get it. If you're going to watch horror movies, guess what? You're going to get nightmares. You're going to get those you know, strange noises coming. Half the time, I try to avoid watching news. I'll be honest with you. Because half the time, most, I'm, not, I'm not going to try to, to be that guy. But most of, the, most of the news that we watch is negative. Talking about the crime rate and this and that and you know, the, the rent is so bad and this is going on. And you know, like, and you're like, yo. So here's the thing. I try to actually just switch off. Because again, what you see is what you get. Because if I'm going to watch news all the time and watch negative news all the time, guess what? All I'm going to be thinking is negative. And then you're going to be parking around negative people and all they're going to be doing and all they're going to be talking about is negativity. And all they're going to be talking about is, you know, going overseas because this place is no longer good enough. I know there's a big game happening also later today. Man U versus Liverpool. Now, so let me just park there quickly and I know you hold your chest and throw it yet. But if you're a Man U supporter, let me just say, what you see is what you get. <laughs> Ooh, I know. Let me quickly change that line. Our ability to see determines what we can receive from God. And that's why I believe with all my might that what Jacob decided to do was, even, although it was conceived to be so crazy, so unpopular, the miraculous God that I serve, the miraculous God that you serve, can do even the craziest things in our life to bring favor in our lives. You see, the whole thing about seeing, and that's what Jacob was trying to, to do, not trying, but he did it. He succeeded in this to actually make the flock see something because what they see, they become. What they see, they get. What you see, you get. And so Matthew 6.22 says the incredible part here. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body 
will be full of light. And so your eye is the lamp of your body. So what you see is what you get. If you see God's goodness, if you see God's favor, if you see his blessing, if you see what God can do in your life, guess what? Your body will be filled with that blessing in your life. And it's not, I'm trying to get you here. It is not some prosperity preaching. What I'm trying to get to is to you understand that your eye has the ability to see what God can do in your life. What you see is what you get. Tell your neighbor right now, what you see is what you get. Yo, I saw some of the husbands here, like, they didn't just stop there, like, what you see. they like, what you see is what you get. It's like, yo. Can I share a little bit about myself, quite, you know, for just a moment? I remember when myself and Roxanne were just in our early stages of marriage. And I'm going to be vulnerable with you. And so we, were, we, we didn't have a lot. It was in the early stages of our marriage, and I needed to provide for her. And, you know, I remember the conversation I had with Roxanne's dad. Like, he literally just said to me when I asked for Roxanne's hand of marriage, all he said to me was, as long as you give her medical aid, I'm happy. <laughs> it's like... And in my mind, I'm thinking, yo, do you know how expensive medical aid is that? <laughs> but that's all he required. But in our early stage of marriage, I remember we were living in this flat in Montclair, you know, a few minutes away from here. And we were living in this um, three-bedroom flat. And we were, there's the lounge. And then it had a little, little cove where the kitchen was. And Roxanne will be in the kitchen. And every night, I will be on the computer. It was one of those old computers. You know, and I was like on the computer and Roxanne can see me through the cove and she would see me there. And I would literally just go on because I had this desire to actually study theology. But then I would just go on and I would go through all the courses and see what the courses are available. And I was like, yo, I didn't know the word of God is so expensive. Yo. So I would look and look and I would just look and I was like looking at the courses and I was like, eh, and I'm like looking at the prices and I could see Roxanne and we just like, ah, oh, yo, I don't know if this is going to happen because then I had the desire not just to, to do theology, but I, I had this earnest desire to, to do my bachelor's in theology. But I was like, yo, that's expensive. Like maybe I must just maybe put my standard down, just maybe a, a, a certificate, you know, of maybe a certificate of completion. Or better yet, a certificate of, 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 you know, just be attending. But a bachelor's is like, whoo. But every night, hey, Roxanne, every night I will switch the computer on. Even though I, could, I know I couldn't afford it, I would just go through the curriculum and see it. And say, oh, I like this subject. Oh, this is nice. And I would visualize myself actually doing the course. Every night. And then I had the blessing where... You know, I actually got where they actually said to me, and this is this church that actually said to me when I came to them, and they said to me, we want to bless you. We actually want you to go for, you know, theology studies. And guess what? I thought, no, what I see is what I get. I want to not just do any studies. I want to go for my bachelor's. But here's the crazy part. If you know me, I'm not very academic, you because now I'm, I'm like maybe I must just stick to the certificate of attendance <laughs> but I registered got everything paid for I didn't have to put a cent in and I'm standing here a couple of years later I've got my bachelor's degree <laughs> now again I want you to understand this because I don't want you to think that I'm bragging here I'm giving thanks this morning to God. Because what you see is what you get. Me sitting there every night watching that computer, even though I know I cannot afford it, even though my academics are not all that great, but I will continue to just believe because what I see is what I get. Okay. Can I do another break quickly? Okay. I have a white Ferrari. Why are you laughing? Show my white Ferrari. Yeah! Come on now. Woo! That's my white Ferrari. 
So here's the incredible story about my white Ferrari. Okay? We had, before this white Ferrari, we had a Hyundai Gates. Now, who knows what a Hyundai Gates is? You know how small a Hyundai Gates is? Well, this thing is like a Uno. We used to, when we were still at church in the mall, we used to take all the sound equipment, everything in that Hyundai Gates. And we were to travel up and down, up and down in that Hyundai Gates. I don't know. There was just, you know, like, like I would like, you know, you know, like Jesus was doing the, you know, the miracle of feeding the multitude. I think he was just making the, you know, feeling the capacity in that Hyundai Gates. Because there was just more space. We two, two speakers in, there was more space for a third speaker. And I was remembering, and, and all we said to ourselves was like, this is God. This is God's car. But that car also had its own issues, mechanically, eventually. And then we decided it's now time for us to get a new car. But affordability versus what we need doesn't match up. And so I remember the day we went to go look for the car. We saw this white Ferrari sitting there, and we're like, yo, we like this white Ferrari. And we look at the price tag, and we're like, yo, it's definitely a white Ferrari. And we're like, I don't know if this is going to be something that we can afford. So long story short, Roxanne went back, and I was sitting there working through this, and I spoke to the sales agent, and I said, this is what we can afford. This is per month that we can afford. And so, by the way, I don't want to pay a balloon payment because I don't like the balloon payment. So this is what we can afford. True story. True story. The guy laughed in my face. He said to me, you can't do this. They will never accept this. The banks will never come back to you about this. So I'm like, well, I look at the car. I look at my finances, and I'm like, what I see is what I get. And so I prayed. And I stood, stood there by the sales agent, and I parked there. And I said, I'm not budging. So then the first bank came back, and they said, sorry, we can't help you with this. And I'm like, that's fine. Then the second bank came back and said, sorry, we can't help you. Your total is too crazy. And then the sales agent came, like, very, like, can we get you a coffee, sir? Almost like to soothe me down because the third one is going to come. It's also going to be a denial. And he says, maybe, maybe you should just go home. And I said to him, no, I'm staying here. And we waited and we waited. Remember, Roxanne, we waited. And the guy's like, we're going to close just now. You, you, I think they just forgot about you. And then I waited. And then the guy came back with a form and he like, I don't know, I, I, I almost looked like he, he saw a ghost. He was so like, and he says, I don't understand this. The bank approved it with no balloon payment, exactly the amount that you wanted it to pay per month, and here you go. This is yours. Now, why I say this? Because again, what you see is what you get. What you see is what you get. We honor God by making Him the common object of our faith and the center of our worship. To honor is to value. And we must learn to value Jesus above everything else. We must learn to seek His face. I think far too often we struggle with this idea and concept. We want to seek His hand instead of His face. And God says, I first want you to know me before you ask for things. Because if you know me, you will know that I will look after you. But we often miss that. To seek him is to behold him in his word and in worship. To behold him is to stare at him. If you stare at him long enough, you'll begin to sense his love and realize that he has been staring at you all the time. It is impossible to stare at two different things at the same time. Let me just say this. You, you cannot stare at two things at the same time. You're either going to be staring at God or you're going to be staring at your problem. You're either going to be staring at God that is your provider or you're going to be staring at what you're lacking. You cannot stare at two things at the same time. 
You cannot stay at your symptoms and stay at your savior simultaneously. Instead, you, would, you should practice staring and looking. Like, I always tell Roxanne, and we did it with a couple of you know, premarital counseling, was we say when you talk about communication, we say, if you're going to be talking to somebody, look them in the eye. Because those who are you know, in relationships, you know sometimes when your spouse tells me, I don't think you're listening to me. You know why they say that? Because you're not looking at them. They know that you value them when you look at them, when they are talking to you. And the same principle applies even in our relationship with God. God knows when you are listening, when you are looking to Him. Because oftentimes we want the favor of God, we want the blessing of God, we want the protection of God, but we don't even give Him five seconds to stare at Him. It says, in Hebrews 12, 2, unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. So stay at him, not at anything else. Gratitude changes the lens through which we see our circumstances. Gratitude changes the lens through which we see our circumstances. Let me explain this perspective. Let me explain this point to you very vividly, quickly. Acts 3 Verse 4 and 5. If you have your Bibles, you can turn it. It should also be on the screen because this is an incredible, incredible story to understand the whole thing about changing your lens that changes your perspective if you have gratitude. Because here we find that Peter actually sees this lame man that sits at the front, not inside, but at the front gate of the temple. He has placed there. People have put him there every day, have placed him day after day, have placed him there. And then Peter and John comes through on that particular day, and they walk past him. And if you read the scriptures further on, it actually says that he recognized them. He recognized Peter and John. But I'll explain why I believe of all my heart that when he recognized, he didn't recognize to fully gaze upon them. Because this here tells us why. Because in Acts 3 verse 4 and 5, And Peter directed his gaze on him as did John and said, Look at us. So it tells me that this man wasn't actually looking at them. Although he recognized them coming past, he was almost in a sense like this. Not fixing his eyes on them. Why? Because he was fixing his eyes on his problem. Because he knew if he can fix his eyes on his problem, people will feel sorry for him. So he fixes his eyes only for a moment, and then he looks back to his problem. But here Peter says to him, Look at us. Almost telling the person, don't look at your legs. Don't look at your handicap. Don't look at your shortcomings. But look at me. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. What he was expecting wasn't a miracle. What he was expecting was just a short temporary thing. was just money. But Peter and John had something better in store. God has got something better in store. Even though this man probably expected to get natural currency from them, God had a greater miracle in store for him. The same principle applies to us. Spiritually, miracles still happen as a result of looking and expecting. Looking and expecting. Can I tell you, God is still in the business of doing miracles. God is still in the business of doing breakthrough. God is still in the business of providing for you and your family. But you need to fix your gaze on Him. I was thinking about it even this morning as I was just getting ready. I could change the title just on that scripture alone. I can unpack this scripture in a whole different sermon series. And I thought about myself, maybe I must make a series of that. Parking in the handicap area. Because that's literally what he was doing every day. 
parking in a handicapped area. I told you, go read it for yourself. He wasn't able to go inside the temple. He rather sat in front of the temple. Because after this miracle, Peter and John says to him, no, 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 no. You're not staying here. You're going with us inside. Because you're going to be a testimony to the rest of the people that is inside. Because they walk past you. They know who you were. But they are going to see something more greater that you have inside of you. The same people that just gave you money now are going to be like, what? This guy is actually walking now. Just bear with me for a moment. I know this is going to sound crazy, but I want to have crazy faith. And it bugs me. It bugs me. I don't mind if we have this because, you know, the law of the land says we have to have these things. And it is to make services comfortable, make things a little bit more easier for people. And please, there's no disrespect to those who have handicaps or those who are in wheelchairs. But I want to get to a place. And I want to have this crazy faith where I want to say that we as a church... We don't have handicapped parking anymore. Because we want to have a church of so radical faith that when you drive in, faith is already starting to happen in your life that you don't have to look for handicapped parking. You don't have to look for wheelchair-friendly seating. Because what did they say? You are parking there and you're staying there. But I want crazy faith to say we're taking all those things away. Because my God is so good so great that he is still in the business of performing miracles. And so this morning, church, what are you thankful for? What is God doing in your life? Maybe you need to change your lens a bit. Because for far too long, maybe this whole year, you've only been fixing on your problem and not fixing your gaze on him. Because again, as I started with the title, I'd like to bring this to a closing with the title. What you see is what you get. What you see is what you get. And so what are you staring at right now? Because your gaze will determine what you believe in God. Yo, that's another point I didn't even put in there. Your gaze will determine what you believe in God. Because if you're going to continue looking at your problem, then it been, for me, what that means is that you don't believe God to do the miracle in your life. If you're going to continue looking at your shortcomings, your hurt, your pain, your regret, God knows all of those. That's why I believe with all my heart, He uses people like Peter and, and John. Because that's why Peter says to him, look at us. For that moment, just take your eyes away from your problem and look at us. Because we are the image carriers of God. And so this morning, in your situation, in your problem, just fix your eyes away from that. Yes, it's real. Yes, it's there. Because believe me, the layman knew he cannot walk. It is there. But Peter just wanted him to change his perspective from changing his lens to seeing what God can do in that situation. You know what I love about this story? Because again, the Bible does not hesitate to put some words and some names in there. And again, I tell you the power of the words that are in there. Because the very place he sat is called the beautiful gate. So here's this man with a messed up situation, with a messed up life. Because it says that the people always took him to that particular place. To the place beautiful. And I love that even in our messiness, even in our messed up state, God can still take something and make it beautiful. And so this morning, as you prepare your heart, because that's where Thanksgiving offering still has to come forth first, is in your heart. What are you giving God thanks for? Is it just for your family? Is it just for the fact that you're alive? 
Is it for the fact that you just had a job opportunity, you had breakthrough, you got healed from some sickness or disease? Maybe when you listen to this testimony, you're like, but my testimony is not that big. Mine is small. Can I tell you? A testimony is a testimony. Thankfulness is thankfulness. And so this morning, give God your thanks. There has to be a reason for you to be thankful. There has to be a season for you to be thankful. There has to be a time for you to be thankful. For you to say, God, I am so thankful for what you're doing in my life. This is what I'm thankful for. This is what I'm thanking you, God. You might be thankful for a whole lot of things, but today we are showcasing, God, what we are thankful for. Look around you and see all the people being thankful for. See what they are thankful for. Celebrate with them because they are celebrating with you what you are thankful for. You might not get your car yet. You might not get your house yet. You might not get your child yet. You might not get that breakthrough yet. But it doesn't mean it's not coming. Because guess what? What you see is what you get. So if there's a breakthrough that you are looking for and somebody is holding up that breakthrough, look at that breakthrough. Because what you see is what you get. What you see is what you get. If there's a breakthrough there, go find it. Go look for it. Fix your eyes on that. Fix your gaze on that. Because what you see is what you get. Come on, church. What you see is what you get. What you see is what you get. Somebody get excited. What you see is what you get. Come on, church. Are you excited? What you see is what you get. Somebody put your praise on. Somebody put your miracle on. Somebody say amen. I know we're getting excited, but that's what I love about excitement. God is stirring something in our hearts. God is not done with us yet. God is not finished with you yet. Your miracle is coming. Your breakthrough is coming. Do not lose hope. Do not lose faith. And do not, do not fix your gaze back on your problem. Keep fixing your eyes on Jesus. And so even in that moment, I want you to get ready with your communion emblems because This is a time of also thanksgiving where we give God thanks even in a time as we're sharing at the table to give God thanks for His sacrifice, for what He's done. And what better way to do this, to do this together as a family, to share in communion together, believing and trusting that He is the ultimate sacrifice. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this week's sermon. If you need prayer or want more information about Sweetwaters Church, please email us at info at sweetwaterschurch.co.za. Until next week, be blessed and know that we are praying for you.